a series called Snapshots, and we're talking about living life between the highlights. And I want to talk to you about journeying with Jesus. You know, there's a lot of talk in our day and age in Christian circles about the journey. You guys have heard this, right? About the journey. You hear about it on the radio. You hear about it in books. And I want to share with you about journeying with Jesus. And, you know, when you, you think about a journey, when you think about a trip that you're taking, uh, there's some things that are really important to take along with you, right? I mean, not everything is vitally important, but there's some things that you absolutely have to t have with you when you go on a trip. For instance, if you want to travel across the ocean, you want to journey across the ocean, I mean, it doesn't matter if your boat is red or if it's blue. It doesn't matter if your life jackets are yellow or they're orange. A lot of things don't matter. But let me tell you one thing that you absolutely have to have if you're going to journey across the ocean, you have to have a compass. If you try to go across the ocean without a compass, you very likely could end up spending the rest of your life just going in circles, never finding land. There are some things on a journey that are vitally important that you absolutely have to have with you. If you were going to trek across the Sahara Desert, it doesn't matter if you forgot your camera or not, or if you're wearing a tan shirt or you're wearing a brown shirt. Those things don't matter, but some things are vitally important. If you're going to travel across the Sahara d Desert, you absolutely have to have water, right? There's things that are vitally important when you travel. A lot of us, we try to travel throughout this life, and uh, we make things out to be very important that are not so important. There's things that we try to add to our life that we think is going to enhance our life, but it's not really that important. Some people are going to live in big houses. Some people are going to live in small houses, and some people will make a Bill Gates-level salary, and I hope it's someone here and you stay with us for a while, um, <laughs> but some of you may not. But that's not what's important. But what is vitally important is that as we go through this life, that we go through with Jesus Christ. That's of absolute vital importance. My wife and I, we traveled down to Costa Rica in the summertime, and my wife, she was super blessed. She got to spend five weeks down there. I only got to spend two weeks down there. My wife's from Costa Rica, so we were visiting family and friends. And while we were down there, we watched a movie. Now, my wife likes two kinds of movies. My, li my wife likes super intense, like nail-biting thrillers, or she likes chick flicks. Those are the options, all right? So we watched a chick flick. Now, truth be known, Justin actually likes chick flicks as well. Tells me about them all the time, all right? <laughs> so we watched this, this movie. Maybe you saw it before. It's with Ashton Kutcher. Is that how you pronounce his name, girls? Kutcher? Is that good? Okay. I, I got to ask the girls because guys don't know how to pronounce his name. All right. So it's got Ashton Kutcher and Brittany Murphy, and the movie's called Just Married. Have you guys heard of it before? Maybe you've seen it before? So my wife and I are watching it. Basically, it's about this guy who comes from a modest life, and uh, then he meets this girl who comes from the other side, and, I mean, she's super rich, and uh, they fall in love. They get married, and on their honeymoon, uh, they decide they don't love each other very much, and it's nothing but a big hassle and arguments, and, of course, at the end of the movie, they find out that they actually do love each other and live happily ever after. But after he gets back from his honeymoon, he sits down with his dad, and he's sitting there with his dad, and his dad's looking through the photo album from the honeymoon, and this is actually the quote from the movie that his dad says. He says, you never see the hard days in a photo album, but those are the ones that get you from one happy snapshot to the next. You know, life is full of moments. Life is full of moments that are good and bad. There's ups and downs. There's highs, there's lows. And of course, we don't fill our photo albums with all of the memories that were low or the memories that were bad. But through it all, the question is, who are we walking with? What are we actually living for? When you stop and you think about the highlights of life, just think with me for two minutes. Stop thinking about everything that's going on in your life right now, but just think about your memories. Just think about your past. When you stop and you think about all of the things that you've gone through and that you've been through. I mean, I can remember as far back as when I was two years old, I, I have memories of my grandfather whistling. I mean, I can remember birthday parties, and I can remember uh, going up to our family cabin. You know, I remember my first year of school. I can remember some of those days. I, I remember being bullied in elementary school. You know, some memories good, some memories that are bad. I remember holidays. A lot of you guys remember holidays, and playing with your cousins and having a good time. You have memories of 
Your first day of high school. How awkward was that, right? <laughs> you have memories of going through driver's training, finally getting your license. I remember when I got my permit. The day I got my permit, my, it was in January. My mom had me drive home, and I drove right into a snowbank. <laughs> and I don't think I drove again until July that year. You know, we remember graduating from high school. Some of you have memories of being denied the scholarship that you wanted or maybe not being able to go to the school that you wanted to go to. People have memories of their engagement and, oh, how happy our wedding day is and all the, the fantastic photos that are taken and the memories that are made on our wedding day. People have memories of their first pregnancy. Others have sad memories of miscarrying or not being able to have children. Maybe it's a memory of when a parent had died or you received a job promotion or maybe you saved up enough money and you were able to go on the vacation of a lifetime. Maybe you have memories of when you bought your dream home. Or maybe it's bad memories because of the recession and all of a sudden we lost our jobs and people have memories of going bankrupt. Memories of realizing how much debt I've actually accumulated buying so many things that I don't actually need. Some people have memories of losing their dream home. People have memories of seeing their kids graduate. For me last year, I had a very sad memory when my grandmother, who's almost 90 years old, saw her 68-year-old 68 68 daughter die of cancer, my mom. That was a very sad memory for me. That was a low. That was hard for my grandmother. She never thought she'd outlive her daughter. Memories of retirement. Some people have memories of first hearing about their diagnosis, uh, being diagnosed with a terminal illness and people have memories on their deathbed, and people will die. When you stop and you think about life, you have got to bring into consideration what is vitally important. There's a lot of things about life that we make important that are not nearly as important as other areas that are so important. And so I want to talk about journeying through this life, and I want to talk about journeying with Jesus. So I have a couple of points, and if you want to keep track of these in your notes, feel free to. The first one is this. I want to talk to you about the trip of a lifetime. The trip of a lifetime. And I want to look at Matthew chapter 7. If you have your Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 7. We're also going to put it up here on the screen, but I think it's great if you bring your Bible to church and you read this in your Bible so you can go back home and you can study it yourself. But Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, talking about the trip of a lifetime. I hope you all are on it. Amen. Matthew 20, or, or verse 7, verse 24. If you found it, say Amen. All right? So the Bible says, Matthew 7, 24, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man. These are the words of Jesus Christ. If you have a red letter, letter Bible, you'll notice that these letters are in red. This is the very words of Christ. He says, Anyone who, who does them will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. And the rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. In Matthew chapter 7, in this passage of Scripture, Jesus is talking about how we build our life. Now, Jesus made it extremely simple. We complicate things, religion complicates things, but Jesus makes it simple. He says there's just two types of people. And Jesus is blunt and he doesn't mince his words. He says there's fools and then there's wise people. Now, I remember the first time that I, I saw this in the scripture. I'd read this scripture many times before, but many years ago, I noticed this for the first time. Notice what Jesus says that's the same about two, the, 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 the two groups of people. The similarity is they both hear his word. And that blew me away. That totally blew me away. You know, so many people are sitting in churches and they're hearing the word. They're hearing what Jesus said. They're hearing the message of salvation. They're hearing what God is calling them to do in their life. But only one type of person, the wise, are the ones that apply what Christ has said to their life that changes them. And so both of these types of people are hearing the words one is doing them, and the other one is not doing them. When you stop and you think about how fast life moves along, I'm telling you, 32 years old, and my weeks go by so fast. 
I mean, I remember when summertime when I was a kid, it seemed like it lasted forever. Now summertime, I wish it would last forever, but it just doesn't. But my point is this. Moments in life are changing fast. They're changing fast. And the older you get, the faster life seems to move along. And the question is, how are you going to journey through this life? Are you going to journey through this life making decisions on the things that you think are most important for your life? Or are you going to make them based upon what Christ has called you to do and what the Word of God tells us to do? This house that Jesus is speaking about building here, this is a process that takes a lifetime. But it has to be begun at some point. The Bible doesn't teach uh, that, that, that people were just born into salvation. In fact, in John chapter 3, Jesus says that a man must be born again. The journey has to begun, begin at some point in your life when you trust Christ as your Savior. I've told you before, if anyone should have been born a Christian, it should have been me. I had two generations behind me of church planters. I had very, very spirit-filled uh, parents. But I did not come to Christ and start my journey with Christ until I was 18 years old, and now I've been 14 years on this journey with Jesus. And I'm telling you, it's the journey of a lifetime, and it's an exciting journey. But every day, I've got to decide, how am I going to build my life? Am I going to be a fool, or am I going to be wise? And that's determined by whether or not I'm willing to open up the Bible and read what God says and apply it. That's the key, apply it to my life, because everyone's hearing his words. People are hearing his words. But what changes everything is when you take the word of God and you apply it to your heart. You know, as we talk about this journey throughout life, I want to talk to you about how to pack. I'm a great packer. My wife knows. I've got lists on my computer. I can literally go at any moment, and I can just print out a list. I've got lists for myself. I've got camping lists. I've got rock climbing lists. I've got snowboarding lists. Um, I've got overseas travel lists. I've got domestic travel lists. I've got lists for my girls. I'm telling you, I've got everything that I need. I'm telling you, I've accumulated these lists over years and years and years of travel experience. All right? So what I've learned that's important about preparing and packing for a trip is that you want to pack well enough that you might not need everything, but in case you do, you got it. Now, my wife and I, we went up to Duluth for just an overnight, and I packed so well for our daughter. I was responsible for diapers. I brought, for an overnight trip, I brought 40 diapers. Man, you never know what's going to happen. We could have gotten snowed in up there. And my wife, you guys are laughing because that's overkill. But you got to be ready in case, right? My wife was laughing at me. She's like, oh, 40 diapers, what? That's like for a week. And she forgot to pack socks. <laughs> See what I'm saying? Now, if I had packed socks, it would have been 12 or 13 pair of socks. But you want to be so well packed that in case you need it, you might not use it, but in case you need it, you've got it. I want to tell you something. That's the way God packed for your journey. He did all the packing for you. Because he knows what you're going to need before you actually even need it. And he's going to supply it so you don't even have to. He will provide for you. And he's got everything packed for the journey. But you've just got to dig into the word of God. And you've got to pull it out when you need it. I love this verse in 2 Peter 1.3. And think about this as we're talking about the journey of a lifetime. The Bible says in 2 Peter 1.3, it says, As his divine power has given to us all things. Say all things. All things that pertain to to life and godliness. So everything that you need to know about life is already contained within the Word of God. It doesn't matter if it's business, if it's family, if it's, if it's uh, your future, if it's your, your, your college. It doesn't matter what it is. It's all contained within the Word of God. If it's finance, I mean, it's all there. Family, marriage, God has everything that pertains to life and godliness. Now, there's some things that I might need for my journey that you don't need, and there's things that you need that I don't need, but this is one thing I know is that God packed well for our journey, and it's all there for us. Everything that we need to know about righteous living, about godliness, about how to serve God, about what God wants done in the earth, all of it's contained in the Scripture. He gave it to us in full. It's there. Think of your Bible like a suitcase on the journey. And when you need something, when you're facing a problem, when you're facing a trial, when you're facing a struggle, when you need an answer, dig in the suitcase that God gave you called the Bible and start pulling out the Word of God in different trials, in different seasons of your life. 
In 2 Timothy 3.16, the Bible says, all scripture is God-breathed. All of it has come from God. And the Bible says that all of his scripture is profit profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. And I love this, verse 17, that the man of God or woman of God may be complete. Someone say complete. Complete. That means you have everything that you need for your journey. He didn't forget anything. You might be going through a situation right now in your life and you don't know the answer to it. God knows the answer to it. And he'll show it to you in his word. If you start praying, you start seeking him, you get into the Bible, you start asking other people questions, and you'll soon find that wisdom, that truth, that promise that God has for your life. And so the Bible says that you may be complete. When you feel incomplete, go to the word of God and find what God has for you in his word. And the Bible says equipped for every good work. So you might feel inadequate. You might feel that you're not ready. And let me tell you what. When you take steps of faith and you start pursuing after God, God's going to lead you into places that are far beyond your ability. But he's going to make up the difference and he'll supply you with whatever is needed. But you've got to dig into the word of God and you've got to find those truths for yourself. Going back to 2 Peter in chapter 1 verse 4. I love this verse right here. By which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. Now God says he's not just given us promises. Now, that would have been good enough. God doesn't even say in his word that he's given us precious promises, does he? God says in his word that he's given us great and exceedingly great and precious promises. Now, I can see some of you. You guys are like, what is he even talking about? Man, I learned this from my grandmother. My grandmother used to have a little box, and she had scriptures written on them, and it was called a promise box. And when she would face something in her life, she would go through that box and she'd find promises in God's word. If it was some area of defeat, if it was some area of financial, if it was some area of healing. And she taught us, and she literally told us to do this. I know it sounds strange, but it's kind of like just to kind of visualize this. She would take those promises and put them in her shoes. And she would say, I'm standing on the promises of God. And every time she felt that wiggle around in her shoe, she would remember to pray and not trust her circumstances or her emotions, but she would trust God's word and what God has said. And I learned that through my family, and I've learned to dig into the word of God, and I've literally seen miracles. There is no way to humanly even explain some of the things that God has done in my life, in my wife's life, in our family's life, uh, based upon his promises, his word. Because when we would face something, we'd get into the word and we'd start to pull out the promises of God. Now the Bible says that he's given us, these are for us, exceedingly great and precious promises. And look at the next part, it says, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature. If you want to be a partaker of the nature of God, if you want to experience everything that God has for your life, if you want to walk in the fullness of his plan, if you know that there's, some, there, there, there's going to be days ahead where you need tools, you need resources, there's something you need God to do to break through in your life, go to his promises. Start digging in to, to the scripture and you'll find answers for all of your problems because he's already given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Amen? That's good news, amen? So he's packed well for our journey. Let me talk to you about this now. A lifetime of abiding. What type of relationship does Jesus want with us on this journey? Well, in John 15, 4, we're going to read these two verses where Jesus is speaking about abiding in the vine. In John 15, 4. So we'll read these two verses. I love this passage of scripture. Jesus says, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, Neither can you unless you abide in me. Verse 5, I am the vine. Jesus says, you are the branches. Jesus says, he who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. And don't miss this last part of verse 5. The words of Jesus Christ, for without me, you can do nothing. Now, Jesus is speaking to disciples. He's speaking to people that know who he is. And I trust that there's many disciples in here, and so I want to speak to you about the type of relationship that Jesus Christ, he wants to have with his people. He wants 
an abiding relationship throughout your life. That word abiding actually has the, the same uh, connotation or the meaning of a husband and wife that dwell in the same place all the days of their life. Jesus wants a remaining relationship, an abiding relationship, a dwelling relationship with you. Now, do you really believe the words of Jesus? Do you guys really believe the words of Jesus? Jesus says, without me, you can do nothing. So as you're walking through this life, how do you think you're going to be able to accomplish the things that you need to accomplish without Christ? We have to stop and realize without him, we can do nothing. We sing a song in worship here uh, that he gives us the breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise. I mean, everything that we have is a gift from God. Everything is by his mercy. Everything is by his grace. And what he wants us to do is he wants us to live in vital union with him because he says, without me, you can do nothing. You know, I think all of you would be able to relate with this in one way or another. But have you ever felt like God is so close in your life? Usually when you first come to Christ, you trust him as your savior. And you're reading the Bible and it's just like the, 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 the scriptures are jumping off right into your heart and it's like you can just close your eyes and reach out your hands and just touch him. He's so close. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, he feels so intimate and so close. But then you go through a trial in your life or that relationship falls apart or, you know, someone offends you. And all of a sudden, it seems like God isn't so close. You guys know what I'm talking about? I'm, I'm not the only one, right? You know what I'm talking about? And it's like, well, God, where are you? And you're, you're running around, you're looking for God, and you just don't feel like he's as close as he used to be, so a lot of times we end up just giving up. Jesus says, for without me you can do nothing. Look what Jesus says in John chapter 15 in verse 4. I want to look at just this one statement. Jesus says, abide in me, and I in you. Just think about that for a moment. Abide in me, and I in you. Jesus says, abide in me, and I in you. Jesus is not making a conditional statement here, because if it was conditional, he would have said, if you abide in me, then I will abide in you. To experience the power of the relationship, it takes two. And let me just tell you something about Jesus. He's already doing his part. He's waiting every day to hang out with you. He wants to spend time with you. He's waiting for you to seek him. He's waiting to reveal new things to you. If you'll open up the word and begin to read and seek after him, he's already doing the abiding. When you trusted Christ as your savior, the Bible says that he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. The Bible says that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Even as far back as Malachi in the Old Testament, the Lord says, I am the Lord and I change not. He's not going to break your heart. He's not going to destroy your trust. He's going to be faithful to his part. And he's abiding. It's not a condition. But to experience the fullness of power in the relationship, you have to abide as well. I can abide with my wife and love my wife and be faithful to my wife and be good to my wife. But if my wife doesn't want to abide with me, then I can and she can't experience the fullness of that relationship. Does that make sense? So Jesus wants us to experience the fullness of the relationship. But in order for that to happen, we must abide. And he already makes the promise, I in you. And let me tell you something about that. We shouldn't put all the pressure on ourselves. How good am I abiding? Let me tell you what. However good you can abide, Jesus can abide better. He's already doing a better job. Our faith and our trust shouldn't be in our ability to do it, but our faith and our trust should be in his nature and in his character and in his love and in his mercy and in the fact that he's already paid for our transgressions at the cross. He's already purified us. He's already made us holy to enter in and to abide with him. And his abiding is better than mine. And so I can rely on him and I can trust him. Jesus says, abide in me. And I in you. He says, the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. 
We are the branches. Christ is the vine. There must be this vital union between the branches and the vine. And when the branches and the vine connect, there is this divine energy that flows through the branch and produces fruit in your life. So I believe Jesus, he wants a, a lifelong abiding. You know, and I know in my own personal life, I see this with my kids. You know, sometimes, like, God seems elusive to us, like I was talking about a moment ago. And, and with my kids, it's kind of funny because if you know my, my, my oldest little girl, she'll be three in November. She is a daddy's girl. And anyone that knows her really well knows she's a handful. And she hates it when I go away. She hates it when I go into my office. I do most of my work uh, for, for the church and also my, my profession outside of the church. I do most of it at home. I have an office. i got to lock myself away in the office and just get my work done because my little girl will literally hang from the doorknob. So what I've had to do is I've had to become kind of this elusive parent. So I'll, I'll sit there and I'll play with her and, you know, we'll, we'll uh, play games and interact and have fun and we'll be laughing. And then she gets distracted for like 20 or 30 seconds, right? She, she starts watching the TV. She stares at the TV. And that's my moment. And I got to get away. <laughs> So I, I run away real quick, and literally sometimes I peek around the corner, and my daughter's like this. And I'm sure she's thinking, where the heck did he go? My dad disappears. And that's how our relationship sometimes is with God. It's like, man, we're interacting, and everything's all good, and then we get distracted by something in life, and all of a sudden it's like, God, you're so elusive. Where did you go? You didn't go anywhere. Just like I didn't really go anywhere. I'm still abiding in the same house. I'm just dwelling in the other room. <laughs> I got my, my eyes on my daughter. I can hear what's going on. I know my wife's in the kitchen right around the corner. She's young now, and so I, I probably am very elusive to her. But you know what? When you get a little bit older, you realize that your parents are not nearly as elusive as they were when you were younger. I mean, how many of you actually come home and you pass mom in the kitchen like, hey, mom, how are you doing? Hey, Dad, what's going on? I'm going to go watch a movie. You sit down, you watch a movie, and 30 seconds into your movie, you're like, Oh! <gasps> Mom, Dad, where are you? <laughs> you know, something just comes with maturity, right? Maturity. You mature in the Lord, and you start to have this sense about God and His presence that He's, he's near you, that He's with you, that even though I don't abide that good, He abides amazing. He's with me. He's not going to fail me. He's not going to fall short. He's strong. He's able. He's powerful. So you have to press into your relationship with God as you're on this journey. And what happens is you mature in the Lord. You realize he's not very elusive. Not at all. He's with you all the way. Day in, day out. When everyone else betrays you, he's still there. He's faithful. He loves you. He's not going anywhere. And the work that he started in your life, he's going to complete it until the final day. So abide in him. Rest in him. Man, my wife and I, we like to travel. We've done some traveling in Costa Rica. We've done some traveling. My, <laughs> my wife is like, right now, she's sitting in her chair like this. Because she knows I'm about ready to tell a story. So... We've traveled some in Costa Rica. We've traveled a little bit here in the United States. And one thing I've learned about being married to a Latino woman is Latinos absolutely love to take pictures. They do. I go with her family, and I'm telling you, man, they got like four or five cameras going all the time. And so my wife was down in Costa Rica for five weeks, and she had pictures of our kids putting their shoes on, our pictures of our kids sleeping, pictures of our kids eating. And she had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pictures. My wife has a 64-gig iPhone. And all that's on it are pictures, like thousands and thousands and thousands of pictures. And some of her, her pictures are amazing, and some of her pictures, she'll take like 10, 20 pictures of the same thing. It's literally like our kids will be able to watch themselves growing up in like movie form because the pictures are like, <laughs> I mean, literally, we have a picture of like every scene of their entire lives. Some of those pictures t turn out great. Some are our, our memories that are not so good, like when Kyla got desitin all over the couch and she was covered in desitin. Picture! <laughs> so my wife had thousands of pictures. And then something sad happened last week. Her iPhone broke. So we went to the, iPhone, or the Apple store and they said, no, we can't even get the pictures off of there. She felt so bad. Pictures are important. They remind us of our memories, right? 
But let me tell you this. The pictures are not as important as who you're making those memories with. When our kids grow up, we won't have some of those pictures. Some of them we won't have. But our, pic- our kids are going to be like, where are the pictures? Where are the videos? Why didn't we have those? Blah, blah, blah. What they're going to remember is they are going to remember the memories that we made with them. What good is it to have all the pictures and all the videos in the world, but not to have the memories and the experience with your family? And I think that the same is true in our relationship with God because I think we're so concerned about what we have in this life or what God can do for us in this life. And it's about having the house or the clothes or being popular. We're trying to pursue after something that God did not intend for us to have. Maybe some of it he does intend for us to have, but what's, n- what, what's not important is all the things. What's important is that we're journeying with Jesus, that we're living this life with Christ, and that we're traveling together with him. This is the last point I want to make, and I think it's the most important one in my message. This is the last point. End your journey well. Someone famous, I don't know who it was, but I heard this quote one time said, it doesn't matter how you, if you start out well, what matters or what is important is that you finish well. So I want to talk to you about ending your journey well. There's a passage of scripture I want to look at in Matthew chapter 7. We're going to go back there in verse 13 and 14. And we're going to look at this passage of scripture. And the Bible says in Matthew 7, 13, enter by the narrow gate. Jesus, he is that narrow gate. Jesus, he spoke of himself as a door. Jesus said, there's no other way to get in except through me. Thieves and robbers, they'll try to jump over, but I am the door. Jesus said in John 14, 6, he said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the only way. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, the way is easy. Be careful of the easy way that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. In verse 14, the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life and those who find it are few. Jumping down to verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Jesus says, on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And Jesus says, I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. This is speaking about some people. I don't know who they are. I don't know if they're men, if they're women, if they're young or they're old, but they're people that journeyed through life. And they did things, good things, things I've never even done before. But the things don't matter. What does it all matter? If in the end, we live our entire life, we've journeyed through this life, we get to the end, and we stand before Jesus, who is the one who is known in those scriptures, the author, the finisher, the perfecter of our faith. Jesus, the first, the last, the beginning, the end. Jesus, who is Alpha and Omega. Jesus, who is all in all. And we stand before the Lord in that day, having done a bunch of stuff, Is that really what God's concerned about? Because when their journey ends, Jesus sums it up like this. I never knew you. He doesn't just say, I don't know you. He says, I never knew you. There was never a day, there was never a moment, there was never a time in your life that I ever knew you in a personal, in an intimate way. There was never a time in your life that we had a relationship. You've done things. If there's one thing you take away from this message, I hope it's this, end well. And that every day of your life, you'll wake up and you'll think about that, end well. And every decision that you need to make, make sure you're making a decision that leads to you ending well. That's what's going to matter in the end. And I know because I grew up in a Christian culture, I knew all kinds of things about God. I knew how to lead people to Christ as a young boy. I knew all the Bible stories from the Old Testament. I knew all the parables. I went to church three times a week. I knew all about God. But that is not going to cut it in the end because that's not what God's concerned about. He says, I never knew you. 
I never knew you. End well. The truth is everyone's journey is going to end, but not everyone's journey is going to end well. And so individually, we make that choice. We make that choice. And the closing verse I want to show you here is Matthew 25, 23. Here's another man that his journey came to an end. And Jesus says in this parable that his master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. This is a servant that knew his Lord. And when it's all said and done, when the relationships are gone, when the houses are gone, when the money is gone, when the career is gone, when the journey comes to an end and you're on your deathbed and you're reviewing your life, going over all of your memories, can you go from this life to the next and enter in with Jesus Christ standing there saying, well done, my good and my faithful servant. We hope you enjoyed this message from Risen Life. To find more, go to risenlife.net.